I'm here because I'm so very interested and committed to this new way of thinking about American history. The lives of African Americans under slavery um, are a new subject relatively in American history. And their lives were very much intertwined with whites and it was often those whites who left the records. So when I started working on Harriet Tubman, of course I did my work by learning all the lessons I'd learned at Harvard and over in England and at Princeton where I got my PhD, you go and you look at the written records. But what was I to do working on Harriet Tubman, who did not leave a diary, who dictated but left us very few of those letters? Indeed, when I wanted to know about her family and background, I was forced into looking at alternate ways of thinking about American history. And I very much thank some of the archivists who pushed me out of the archives into the wider world to think more broadly about these questions. And it was ironic to me also in looking at Harriet Tubman's quote, owner. Her owner was a man named Edward Brodus. And we know so very little about him. We know that Harriet's mother's mother was owned and was given to a granddaughter. And so Harriet's mother, known as Rit, was brought into the marriage when Mary Brodus and Edward Brodus were married. Um, this is a quite a familiar story. We see it happening in the Jefferson family. We see it happening in the Washington family. Um, but we don't have quite as good of records to trace the Brodus family. Ironically, except for census data, a marriage license, and abstracts from land records, Edward Brodus left us very little to offer us any clues to his life as a Maryland planter in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. In 1852, his will was burned in a fire that destroyed the Dorchester County Courthouse. And it was reconstructed later. Ironically, we know more about Edward Brodus, the slave owner, from black sources. According to Harriet Tubman's brother, their mother, Rit, was able to keep her family together when a slave sale threatened to rob her of her child, because Rit became very alarmed when her owner took money from a man who was a Georgia trader. And this was the common term used in the Triangle area of Delmarva Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, where hundreds upon thousands of slaves were sold down the river, sold south. So when this trader was coming around the plantation and money exchanged hands, Rit was on the lookout because one of her sons was going to be sold. So Brodus tried to summon one of Rit's sons, and she was very much worried about this and went in with a pitcher of water, offering the master and his guest something to drink. When Brodus called for the boy again, this time to harness a horse, she returned to Brodus's side, and Tubman's brother Henry reported the exasperation the master felt. What did you come here for? I hollered for the boy. Harriet's mother then accused Brodus of wanting her son for that Georgia man. Unwilling to resort to force, Brodus was stymied when Rit kept her son hidden, first in the woods and then with friends, and we have a record that this went on for over a month. The prolonged period of subterfuge testifies to the complex strategies and networks of slave resistance, which extended throughout the Eastern Shore. It also suggests that relations between a master and a slave might have been more negotiable than they were in the Deep South. We know that Brodus found a servant who knew where the boy was hidden. He tried to discover his whereabouts. But Ritt said, the first man that comes into my house, I will split his head open. So Harriet Ross must have been both a valuable and formidable woman to stand up to her master, to protect her child with such ferocity. Tubman's brother Henry reported that finally, this slave trader Scott gave up and returned to Georgia without Tubman's brother. This and other family lore makes it clear that Harriet's parents fought to keep their family together. And Henry grimly confided that Brodus pledged that if Ritt would only remain faithful, presumably meaning obedient. He would leave us all to be free. Despite such promises, Harriet's brother recalled, at his death, he left us all to be slaves. Now this story of Ritt's courage is in a book published in 1864, Samuel Howe's report to the Freedmen's Inquiry. It was testimony taken from Afro-Canadians, 
blacks who had crossed the border and were living in Canada. It can also be found in Dorothy Sterling's We Are Your Sisters, and I first came across it in John Blassingame's slave testimony when he was giving the testimony of Henry Stewart. But when I was working on sources, I read it the first time. It was a very compelling story. And then the second time I read it, I was able to recognize that Henry Stewart was actually Harriet Tubman's brother. Because when you escaped to freedom, you took a freedom name. And it wasn't always the name you kept in slavery. So making these connections, even though the records are there waiting for you, sometimes takes finding out family names, going into genealogies, talking to people a while. So it really was a connect the dots for me, that I had already read this history in graduate school, yet I needed to reconnect with it when I was trying to do work on the clandestine networks of the Underground Railroad. We know that Araminta Ross, as she was born in 1825, left behind her husband, John Tubman, in 1845. He was a free black, and it was unusual for a slave woman to be married to a free black, because in 1712, the Maryland law changed, stating that the status of a child would follow that of his or her mother, meaning that every slave woman would give birth only to slave children. So a man married to a slave woman would sacrifice the status of his children. So we know, for example, that to have this unusual marriage, Harriet must have been an incredibly charismatic, an incredibly dynamic person. But she did determine that her character and dynamism would be better served by freedom. Um, sometimes people ask me, how did she know she wanted to be free? I think a question that, you know, it really does feed into American history. How did George Washington and his compatriots know that America should be free and be America? How did Abraham Lincoln know that the nation couldn't stand, half free and half slave? The self-liberators of Harriet's generation knew what freedom was. They saw it around them, and they sought it. And once freed, the young Araminta decided to take a new first name, Harriet. We know it was the name of her mother, and it may have been the name of one of her sisters who was, quote, disappeared, sold away into the South. Perhaps it was a sign of her continuing devotion to her husband that she kept the name Tubman when she went to freedom. And when she escaped the hell of slavery for the heaven of liberty, she said she crossed the line of which I had so long been dreaming. Here was a girl in her 20s venturing out to her, of her home counties for the first time in her life, hoping to make freedom on her own. That first time out in the open, would she have known to rub astafeda, a foul-smelling herb on her feet to elude tracking dogs. She knew to follow the North Star, but what if clouds filled the autumn sky? Tubman had wanted to run away for years, but when she confronted the practicalities of an escape with very few resources, she was rightly hesitant. As a married woman, she was reluctant to leave her husband. However, she felt that being sold south after her master had died was far worse than the open road, and she headed north in 1849. Now, I'm often asked about my resources. What sources do you have? How do you know it's true that she ran away in 1849? She said she ran away in 1849. It appears in testimony given to her first biographer, Sarah Bradford, who she knew both before and after the war, but this first testimony, Scenes in the Life of Harriet Tubman, appeared in 1869. But what's our evidence? How can we prove this? Well, imagine my surprise when I put researchers at the Maryland State Archives, friendly graduate students at the Library of Congress, people all over looking for a record, looking for the Cambridge Democrat to find some runaway notice, because I had looked at the beautiful paintings by Jacob Lawrence of the life of Harriet Tubman, and in them he gives testimony. Uh, he gives a slave runaway notice. But imagine my surprise when in the spring of 2003, a local historical preservationist saw that there was a home that had been in a family on the eastern shore since before the Civil War, and there was the dreaded dumpster in front of the home. It was being sold, and things were being thrown out. So this local preservationist, a man named Jay Meredith, called up the family and asked if he might go through the dumpster. He said, sure, if you clean it up. So he pulled on overalls and rubber gloves and dove in, and what do you think he came up with? In the spring of 2003, the September 
1849 issue of the Cambridge Democrat that had the runaway notice of Harriet Tubman, the first piece of literary evidence. So whenever anyone asks me questions about how I know this was true, I always say, I, I think it'll turn up, maybe in a dumpster. You never know. But it's important to see that she knew why she was running away. She knew that there were anti-slavery pockets dotting the countryside. The Chop Tank Abolitionist Society had been founded in the 1790s in nearby Caroline County, and there were many Quakers in the region. And Tubman confirmed that a white woman assisted her on the first leg of her journey. Quote, Harriet had a bed quilt, which she highly prized, a quilt she had pieced together, and she gave this bed quilt to a white woman, and the white woman gave her a paper with two names upon it and directions how to go to the first house. Now, was the white woman a sympathetic friend? Was the quilt a bribe? We know there were very severe punishments for those involved in the Underground Railroad. Whites had been put in jail for their involvement, for giving help along the way. But this story reveals that Harriet Tubman had skills besides her talents as a worker. She had contacts with white women and with blacks in the region. We know that she was illiterate, so the names that were supplied to her in writing were meant to be given to the person at the next home to prove that she herself was not tricking anyone into cooperating with this clandestine network. Scholars debate how and when the web of assistance for fugitive slaves, conveying them from hiding place to hiding place, began to emerge. By the 1840s, informal networks were well established. The members of the secret network used code words and spoke of themselves as agents of the Underground Railroad. Some were station masters at stations or depots where conductors, UGRR escorts, and their cargo might rest before resuming the journey. We do know that, for example, when we read Thomas Garrett, a merchant, and he said, I sent you three bales of black wool. He was actually talking about fugitives. Fugitives kept on the move at night, rested and hid during the day. If Harriet took refuge in the woods, perhaps they were a retreat that she knew well. She might have sought her daily rest near a hollowed out tree looking for a nest of brown bats to gobble up the pesky mosquitoes. She tried to fade into the landscape during the sunlight, perhaps refreshing herself with provisions that she would have brought along, such as dried muskrat, which was called marsh rabbit by the locals. And after dusk, she would resume her journey northward, avoiding the highways. It was roughly 80 miles from Tubman's Maryland home to Wilmington and a few more miles into safety in Pennsylvania. This nearly 90-mile journey would have taken Tubman anywhere from 10 days to three weeks. Fugitive slaves escorted by UGRR conductors would travel approximately 10 miles a night, but the particulars of Tubman's stealth and speed remain unknown. For years before her escape, Harriet was visited by recurring visions of a flight to freedom. In this dream, she was flying over fields and towns, rivers and mountains, looking down upon them like a bird, and reaching at last a great fence, or sometimes a river, over which she would try to fly. It appeared like, it would, like I wouldn't have the strength to make it, and then just as I was sinking down, there would be ladies all dressed in white over there, and they would put out their arms and pull me across. Certainly we know she had great dreams, great visions, and this was testimony to her deep and abiding Christian faith. Her visions, people have debated, were they a result of illness? We know she had a childhood injury, which might have, might have given temporal lobe epilepsy, but also she often talked about these visions that she had when she would go to sleep, so it may have been from narcolepsy that she had hypnagogic hallucinations, but always she saw great visions. And one of her visions was that she could be free, but if her people weren't free, it was not a true freedom. So once she made her escape to the north, she decided that she wanted to become more involved with not just freeing her immediate family, but the wider family of slaves. Thomas Garrett, who was so central to operations along the Eastern Liberty Lines, was the first father of the 
Underground Railroad in her life, second only to William Still, a prominent free black in Philadelphia who became a great comrade and a benefactor of Tubman's when she landed in Philadelphia when she made it to freedom. William Still, like Tubman, had a family deeply wounded by slavery, and the black community within Philadelphia was galvanized by Still's leadership. He was the center of a core of vigilant Philadelphia leaders. One can imagine Tubman crossing paths with Still soon after her arrival. She would have become intimately acquainted with the safe harbors, including the home of Dr. James Bias, a black physician who gave his bed freely. Black abolitionist Robert Purvis, whose house in the Philadelphia suburbs was equipped with a room hidden behind a trap door. Or William Whipper's home in Columbia, Pennsylvania, which was frequently crowded with fugitives who, after a night's rest, might travel in Whipper's own boxcar, which made frequent runs to both Philadelphia and to Pittsburgh. The story of all these brave souls is really lost. There are actually more good books for young readers than there are for adults. But in the 21st century, I'm pleased to say that I think this is being corrected. The Liberty Line by Larry Guerra was the most recent by a book on the Underground Railroad until just this past year. Um, this spring, Bound for Canaan by Fergus Bordowich has been published, the first history of the Underground Railroad comprehensive in over 40 years. And Hagedorn's Beyond the River and Keith Griffler's Front Line of, Front Line of Freedom have appeared. Um, I know that we know about the battle between the North and South, but I'm afraid that the uh, study of the Underground Railroad is turning into a tilt, a battle between East and West. Uh, the Underground Railroad Freedom Center is located in Cincinnati, Ohio, and a lot of people were upset by that, but I think, rightly, we don't need to wrestle over where the center is, but just to get to the wider, wider circles. It's nearly impossible to attach details, especially dates, to Tubman's various escapes. So I know that many of you have learned there were 19 trips and 300 slaves that she's credited with. Um, that has been disputed by scholars. It continues to be a matter of debate. And I would tell all of you that the latest information is that we don't have any exact dates. We don't have any exact numbers. But there is one number I want you to remember, and it'll come up again, and that's 750. So that'll come up later, and that involves a very daring raid she made. But one of the first raids that I think most of you learn about as young readers is the fact that in 1854, Harriet Tubman went back to her home county and took away three of her family members under the eyes of slaveholders when there was a price on her head, when there were posters asking for the, um, for the capture of Moses. First, Tubman dictated a letter sent to a free black in Dorchester County, a man named Jacob Jackson, whom she trusted would get word to her brothers. She signed the letter William Henry Jackson, which was the name of Jacob's adopted son. Now, she dictated this letter and had it sent. And the biblical coding and phrasing is particularly interesting because although Tubman was illiterate, she was so familiar with chapter and verse of the Bible. She had it read to her every day. And when necessary, she used it in her dictated correspondence, especially as a code. She wrote to Jackson that Jackson's brothers should be ready to step aboard when the good ship Zion comes along. And so Harriet got word to her siblings to meet on Christmas Day. Family lore recounts that Henry's wife went into labor just as he was about to take off for the rendezvous. So he went and got a, wit a midwife. He waited until his child was born. But then he had to go away without a word because torture was often employed during this period in order to wrench information from people. Just before the four siblings planned to head north, they had their father blindfolded and brought to an outbuilding by one of the three other um, fugitives that arrived to escape. In that way, Harriet could embrace her father. She could speak with him after an absence of five years. His eye covering afforded pretense and precaution. If he was interrogated later, Ben Ross could honestly report he had never seen his daughter nor did he see his sons running off. As with most of Tubman's escapes, we know very little about the details. But we do know that the rescue of these brothers, like that of her niece Kizzy, who was her first rescue, was extremely timely, because Harriet's brother Henry commented 
that she came in good season. She brought us all off together, and we rode to Canada and have been here ever since. The story of Canada is really a missing puzzle of the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman went to St. Catharines, which was one of the black towns in Ontario. Her role there was very central. We know that during this period as well, she resettled in Auburn, New York, through her friendship with later Secretary of State William Seward. Seward was a radical in the 50s. Um, he was one of Lincoln's great rivals. He became one of Lincoln's great friends. David Donald has told us much about this friendship, and we'll le learn more this fall when Doris Kearns Goodwin has a book coming out on Lincoln. Um, I'm very struck, and in my book I have a picture of Seward, because we often forget that he was nearly murdered the night Lincoln was assassinated, and he had an injury to his face, and he had a droop in his cheek, and Tubman had an injury as a child and also has a droop, so they did indeed both share many things, but he was very generous, and he gave her a home in Auburn. He sold it to her on good terms, and during that period, Tubman also became involved with another influential man, John Brown. She first met him in May in 1858 in Canada. She spent 1858 and 1859 raising money with campaigns in Massachusetts, with speeches. She got the abolitionists and the literati to open up their pocketbooks for this cause. After Brown's raid in October of 1859 and his hanging in December of 1859, Tubman went into a new phase. John Brown had taught her that slavery is war. He called her General Tubman, and she shifted from Moses, which was her nickname, to what I argue she took on a role as Joshua. She was visiting family in Troy, New York, when Charles Nall, a fugitive slave, had been kidnapped by authorities and was about to be returned to Virginia. Harriet Tubman decided to test the commitment of the good people of Troy. Would they rise to the occasion? She went into the courtroom, armed with a shawl and a basket to disguise herself as an elderly woman. When the marshal began to take Nall away, in the blink of an eye, she transformed herself, whirling out of her shawl, grabbing a hold of Nall, wrenching him free, and dragging him down the stairs into the waiting arms of those assembled below. It was no easy feat, an eyewitness reported she was beaten over the head with policemen's clubs, but never for a moment did she release her hold until they were literally worn out with exertions and Nall was separated from them. Bleeding and unconscious, he was taken to a skiff to go across the river. He might have escaped to freedom, but telegraphing, there were parties waiting on the other side. But also Harriet Tubman led 400 on a ferry across that river and he had been apprehended and put into a judge's chambers. But the battle was not lost because Tubman was bent on liberation. At last, the door was pulled open by an immense, quote, Negro, and in a moment he was felled by a hatchet. Deputy Sheriff Morrison could not stem the tide. The fallen man blocked the door so that it could not be shut. And when the men who had held the assault upon the door of Judge Stewart's office were stricken down, Harriet and a number of other colored women rushed over their bodies and brought them all out and put them in the first wagon starting for the West. The Troy Times weighed in. The rescuers numbered many of our most respectable citizens, lawyers, editors, private men, public individuals. The rank and file, though, were black. And African Fury is entitled to claim the greater share in the rescue. Tubman's very prominent role symbolized that she had become the general John Tubman had a vision. And when she later recalled that there was shot flying like hail above her head, she felt the thick a public battle was where she belonged. Now during this period, we know that she appeared in public and gave speeches. She was quite eloquent at the time. She used a pseudonym, Harriet Garrison, using the great editor William Lloyd Garrison's name. Of course, I have several colleagues who suggest she wasn't very well known, and I always say that I don't think you use a pseudonym unless people know who you were. During the period of the Civil War, for Harriet Tubman, it was the Underground Railroad moving above ground. It was finally the war she was seeking. And she first went to Fort Monroe in Virginia, 
And in May of 1862, Governor Andrew of Massachusetts said, would you go south? Would you go into the occupied territory? Would you do what you do best? And indeed, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who was sent down to head a South Carolina regiment, James Montgomery, who had fought with John Brown, who she'd known um, through the Kansas frontier battles, came together, and Harriet, after nursing and tending to the contraband, did what she did best. She became a spy. She became a scout. And on June 2, 1863, she led the first South Carolina volunteers on Union boats up the river. She knew where the torpedoes were laid because she'd made contact with the slaves who had set them for the Confederates. She knew where the plantation goods were hidden. She knew because she was indeed a great clandestine scout and spy. And on that night, June 2nd, 1863, 750 slaves were liberated deep in the heart of Dixie, which struck fear into the Middletons, the Lowndes, and the other Charleston grandees. They came back triumphant on June 3rd, and it was indeed that very day that the Massachusetts 54th sailed into the harbor, ready to do their duty. So indeed, it's an important turning point because Harriet Tubman's role became no longer anonymous. She was named in the Boston Commonwealth. Her role as a warrior became known. And it was Harriet Tubman's hope that the noble and brave among African Americans would not be forgotten. She allowed her name to go forward because she wanted the bravery of those black troops celebrated. She knew that after the Civil War, chivalry and gallantry might try and be reinvented and racialized as it was by advocates of the lost cause, the Confederates' cult of nostalgia. And these vigilant campaigns would cost African Americans dearly, especially during the prolonged battle to claim rights guaranteed by constitutional amendments and federal enforcement of the law. The rise of the Ku Klux Klan, vigilante violence, and other campaigns of terror swept the post-war landscape. During Reconstruction, Southern freed people and blacks in general became scapegoats, suffering a violent backlash in war's aftermath. And Tubman wanted African Americans to be granted their freedom and dignity. She herself fell victim to this backlash, even as she was returning home a hero. On a train heading north to Auburn from Virginia, she was going through New Jersey. She had a military pass, but the gentleman taking her ticket didn't believe that this black woman could be a soldier. She stuck to her seat and her guns. It took four men to wrest her from her seat. They deposited her in the baggage compartment. They injured her. And so her stubborn resistance meant the battle would continue. This was Harriet Tubman's homecoming. Like so many of her fellow black soldiers, there would be no road rising to greet her as she made the long journey home. The land of Egypt might be behind them, but they were not in the promised land. Now, during her post-war years, Harriet Tubman went into a phase that she'd always been in, and I think it's important to see that she was, first and foremost, a humanitarian. She opened up a charity home. Here she was, a black woman, an ex-slave, trying to earn money, trying to help others, and she wanted to open her home, and she took in the aged, the indigent, the blind, the veteran. Actually, one of the people she took in was a young man named Nelson Davis, who'd served with her in South Carolina. He appeared in Auburn in late 1866-1867. He was discharged in Brownville, Texas, so if you ever get a chance to look at a map, he walked from Brownsville, Texas, up to, to Auburn, New York. And in um, the fall of 1867, John Tubman was killed in Maryland, and Tubman, a great believer in being married before God, was now a widow. So in 1869, she chose to remarry um, Nelson Davis. It was a great contrast to her first marriage when she married in the First Presbyterian Church in Auburn, all political figures, all great men of the town came together. She and Nelson had a 19-year marriage. During that period, she was able to bring her brother, her family, other people there, 
when Nelson died, um, she petitioned for a widow's pension. She had been petitioning for a soldier's pension, but it had been turned down thus far. And in 1892, she received an $8 a month pension. But the townspeople of Auburn knew that she was doing so much good that they came together, they put together a package, and they said, as a soldier, she deserved her own pension. And indeed, in 1899, she was granted not the full soldier's pension of $25, not the nurse's pension of $12, but there was a compromise between the Senate and the House, which often goes on, and she received $20. But it was indeed in the congressional record that she had done war work, that she had contributed to the Union cause. And when Tubman died in the first quarter of 1913, shortly thereafter, Rosa Parks was born, for the rest of the teens, the 20s, and well into the 30s, Tubman's life fell into literary obscurity. There was a biography in 1943, and then in the 1950s, a handful of books re-examined Tubman's life, most notably books by Dorothy Sterling and Anne Petrie. But by the 1960s, there were interest in her accomplishment expanding into the culture. There were um, a steady stream of children's books. In the 1990s, a whopping 21 young adult and picture books appeared, and there were 16 new children's titles between 2000 and 2003, and the revival flourishes. So let the children lead us into the important topics, because Tubman cherished her freedom and her citizenship more than most. She was extremely patriotic, Besides a commitment to racial justice and a passion for liberty, she pe preached the power of persistence. She offered the following refrain, if you're tired, keep going. If you're scared, keep going. If you're hungry, keep going. If you wanna taste freedom, keep going. Born into an age of darkness, an age when America was in the thrall of slavery, Harriet Tubman freed herself and was reborn. She renamed her liberated self and led others to Canaan. And this was not because she saw herself as a hero, but she believed she was doing the Lord's bidding. Not unlike Joan of Arc, with whom she was frequently compared, Tubman viewed herself as an instrument of God. However, Tubman did not manifest messianic qualities, and she didn't see herself as chosen. Instead, she said that each individual has the ability to seize his or her own destiny. And she embraced a universalist view that everyone has the light within. History is a witness to Tubman's heroic deeds and sacrifices along the road to freedom. And although historians may have too long ignored this path, her past remains before us, all around us and urging us, in her own words, to keep going. Thank you.